Step three, protocol. So we have described the two basic ingredients of E91 protocol. Now let's put them together. So like we said, the setting is the following. Alice and Bob can communicate over a classical channel and they share uh, multiple copies of a maximally entangled state. And again, uh, these copies can be generated by Eve herself. Then Alice and Bob randomly choose a, uh, a measurement basis in which they measure their qubits. Alice chooses from these following three measurement bases. So this circle represents the exit plane of a block sphere. So her measurement uh, setting or measurement basis A1 corresponds to measurement in the Z basis. If she does that, she projects the state either into a zero or into a one. She can also measure in the X basis given by the horizontal direction here. Or she can measure by a rotated basis A3, which is uh, a linear combination of Z plus X. Bob, on the other hand, can measure also in the Z basis given by B1, or in this uh, rotated basis B2, which is Z minus X, or in the basis B3, which is over here, given as Z plus X. So why do we have three different measurements per Alice and three different measurements per Bob rather than two, like we had in the previous protocol BB84? And this is, some of these measurements are overlapping and when this is needed for generating the secret random key. Remember, we said that if both Alice and Bob measure the entangled state in the same basis, they can use that information, the classical outcomes, to generate uh, and, and establish a classical correlated random key. On the other hand, we need some rotated bases, such as this A3 and B2 and B3, in order to uh, compute the CHSH expression and see if it violates the classical CHSH inequality in order to establish that Alice and Bob are really sharing an entangled state. So, in order to establish the key, Alice measures either in A1 or A3, and Bob measures in B1 or B3. So, they randomly measure there are multiple copies of uh, entangled states, and then they exchange information about the basis of their measurements. So, for example, Alice has uh, the following choices, A1, A3, A1, A2, A3, A3, A1, A3, and so on. And Bob has some other random uh, string of measurement choices, B1, B3, sorry, B2, B3, B1, and so on. They exchange the information about these bases and they look at the places where their measurement basis choice coincide. So in this case, it's over here. Here, Alice measures A1 and Bob measures B1, meaning both of them measured in the Z basis. If they do that, as we saw, they get uh, anti-correlated outcomes, which they can use to generate a correlated classical key. Over here, again, they measure in the Z basis and here they measure both in the rotated A3, B3 basis. So that takes care of uh, uh, generating the key. In some other cases, they will not measure in bases that coincide, but that's all right. They don't discard these measurements, the results. Instead, they use them to compute the CHSH uh, expression and check if they get the corresponding violation of the classical CHSH inequality. In particular, they look for, for scenarios where both of them measure A1, B3, or A1, B2, A2, B2, or A2, B3. So visually, it, it does corresponds to Alice looking for uh, cases where she measures in the Z basis and in the X basis, and Bob measures in this rotated basis B2 and B3. And then they use those uh, measurement results to compute the following uh, expression, which is just a sum of uh, expectation values where Alice measured B1 and Bob measured B2, Alice measured A1 and Bob measured A3, and so, uh, sorry, B3, and so on.
So this way, they don't need to discard any information like in BB84, but they really get to use it to calculate either the secret uh, 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 correlated key or the CHSH violation. And if they obtain a CHSH expression of less or equal to 2, they say, OK, we cannot conclude that we have an entangled state or not, but it's safer to just abort. Remember, we said that the monogamy of entanglement ensures that if they have an entangled state, then Eve is not strongly correlated with either of them. And in particular, if they have a maximally entangled state, that Eve is not correlated with Alice and Bob at all. So they are looking for as strong a violation as they can get. And if they have a CHSA expression larger than two, then they conclude, yes, we are sharing an entangled state. Therefore, we can proceed with the protocol. So, so far we have considered the case where everything was ideal. There was no noise. But what happens in the real life? How does noise affect our QKD protocols? So in real, real life, Alice and Bob will not be able to generate a perfectly correlated key. Meaning that either noise or the tinkering of Alice will introduce some inconsistencies into the key and they will, therefore the key will be nearly identical. Even if Alice is not trying to actively eavesdrop and disrupt the protocol, still due to inherent noise in the system, these keys will not be perfectly correlated. So what then Alice and Bob have to decide, they must decide on the acceptable security risk. Even if the keys are not perfectly correlated, they have to say, okay, if the correlation is not 100%, uh, but it's very close to 100%, we can still use this to do something useful and use it for co secret communication. If they do that, then they have to engage in two more protocols. One is called the information reconciliation. That takes the initial secret key that's not perfectly correlated and produces a more color correlated key. So it's increasing the correlation between Alice and Bob in their secret key. And furthermore, they also can perform something known as privacy amplification, where they take their generated secret key and they produce a shorter key, which is more secure. So they are basically trying to eliminate any possible correlation with if. So which protocol is better? We have talked about BB84 and the E91. One is based on the indistinguishability of single photons, prepared in um, non-orthogonal bases, and the other one is uh, um, using entanglement-based QKD. And in particular, we, are, we care about the security of both of these protocols. So the question we can ask is, when is the secret key generated? In the case of the BB84 protocol, it's generated when Alice generates her random string, right at the beginning of the protocol. Remember, she generates two uh, random n-bit strings. One is uh, to encode the information about the basis of preparation and the other one about the states in this basis. So if she chooses z basis, is it a zero or a one? If she chooses the x basis, is it a plus or a minus? So the key, the secret key exists right from the beginning, before any communication, before Bob and Alice take place. So that means that a clever if can actually find a way how to obtain some information about this secret uh, bit string B. In particular, you can consider a very paranoid scenario where the uh, random number generator that uh, Alice is using to generate her random bit string was actually produced by Eve and is in some way correlated with Eve. Therefore, whatever, um, whatever bit random bit string that the device produces, that information gets passed on to Eve. And we saw at the beginning of this step, that, of this lesson, that that poses a huge security risk for BB84 protocol. Whereas in the E91 protocol, uh, the secret key is really generated after the uh, entangled pairs of qubits are measured. So not when Eve produces those entangled uh, pairs, not when they arrive to Alice and Bob, but only after Alice and Bob measure them in their random bases. So in that sense, we can say that the key is 
unconditionally secure. And we see that entanglement is a very essential for security. So now let's conclude this step by talking about some entanglement-based QKD experiments. We saw in BB84 that uh, there were network test beds um, for single photon QKD uh, uh, networks. However, the entanglement-based QKD is not as far, but it only exists at the level of uh, es establishing a secret key over a single link. One such experiment was performed over free space, meaning that the um, entangled photons traveled through, through air. And it was done over a distance of 144 kilometers between two islands in the Canary Islands. One was La Palma and the other one Tenerife. And these uh, photons were produced by spontaneous um, parametric down conversion process, which we saw in previous lessons. So the entangled pair of photons was encoded in the polarization of the photons. And the obtained CHSH violation it was of 2.5008. So quite a substantial amount above the classical value of 2. A different, more recent experiment was done over a distance of uh, hundreds of kilometers, but it was done in a lab and uh, over optical fiber. So the fiber was very long and it was wound in the lab or, or like this. And uh, one distance that was tested was 311 kilometers over a standard fiber. And the other distance was 404 kilometers over an ultra low loss fiber. And the obtained bit rate for the secret key was uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 for the longer distance. Now, these bit rates don't actually include uh, the information reconciliation and privacy amplification part. So, if we wish to use uh, this uh, scheme in a real life, we would actually have to perform information reconciliation and privacy amplification, which would further drop the bit rate. And another uh, fantastic experiment was performed with satellites where the satellite actually distributed entangled pairs between two ground stations. And the ground stations were 1,120 kilometers apart. Remember, we said uh, that uh, light travels in a straight line, whereas using a satellite, uh, we can overcome the, uh, the complication of a curved Earth surface to establish a, a, a quantum key over much longer distances. So the total distance was over 1,000 kilometers, and the measured CHSH violation was uh, 2.56. And the obtained bit rate was 0 0.12 bits per second. Now, uh, one could ask the question, what if we actually use the fiber connecting uh, these two ground stations? Well, the, the paper that reported these results estimated that that would have been around 11 orders of magnitude less efficient than using the satellites which is very, very, quite incredible. So this concludes uh, our, our lessons on um, quantum key distribution protocols.